Oh, Canada's politics are broken, and you know what? We could use a few less wackos. Wyatt Claypool, thanks for joining me again to come and talk on the show. I wanted to talk about the nutcases that we have here in our current Canadian political landscape. You're obviously, you're not one of them. You're, you're running for office and I hope you get it because you seem to be one of the uh, more lucid individuals in this country. Oh yeah, no, I try not to be a wacko, but yeah, no, like the entire political landscape these days, even though it's the minority of the actual people who are engaging politically or voting, we're being held hostage by the most narcissistic, the most crazy individuals who seem to drive the, I guess, the news political narratives and whatnot. It, that's the great thing about potentially getting rid of Justin Trudeau one of these days is I hope more things will turn back to normal. So one of the recent ones that's going on in uh, Parliament is, uh, well, we've everybody's been talking about it so I, I barely have to give it an introduction but here's mark garretson on twitter and this is literally one of his tweets it's 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 crazy that this is uh the stuff that they're talking about but it says pierre polyev removed from the house after refusing to condemn a white supremacist group <laughs> of course with a with a misspelling where well, we've all done that i'm not gonna rag on him for that because uh my uh dyslexia kicks in every once in a while and i and i mess up on my thumbnails and whatnot but this is the, the, the i mean first off it's a lie he, there, he was kicked out for calling uh uh justin trudeau a wacko which he said wacko policy but then wacko prime minister there's a bit of a back and forth, but it, the if you can't say that, if you can't say wacko, we might as well just go full bore and say that you must give the prime minister a compliment every time you stand up. Because like <laughs> wacko so lighthearted. We're getting to the point where it's like you haven't give Justin his compliment that yet. You can't ask a question. It, it's silly. So how did we get here? So like <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking at a Canada where the each side needs the extremes to just to compare each other to it's not it's not that they have their extremes and they love their extremes actually it's they love the other side extreme so in this particular case the white supremacist group that they're talking about is diagonal this is uh what what was it wasn't even a real group it was a joke in the beginning and then it turned into a group which they say isn't a group but it is a group of people but it isn't a thing but it, it's trudeau is their biggest fan it's not not pierre polyev obviously they don't even like each other pierre's well, well, and yeah, Justin Trudeau needs these people because as his government gets more crazy, more unhinged and keeps having like all their policies completely blow back, like blow up in their face, they keep making the country worse. The worse the country is, the bigger they need the threats to democracy, to civility. So even though Justin Trudeau is a deeply uncivil man, deeply corrupt, terrible at his job, he needs more people who he can point to on the other side to justify his existence as prime minister. And those same people he points to need Justin Trudeau to make the country worse, to make it seem like their radical ideas are what is the antidote to the craziness, even though they are also crazy people. Well, this is where you got, I got so confused in the whole thing. I didn't pay attention to what, what these people were saying in their podcasts and all of that stuff until they challenged me on, on a really benign thing. I supported a local candidate in my riding and uh, I thought nothing of it. Hey, I'm getting involved in the political system and I want this uh, guy, Marcus Wong, to be the representative to run for the conservatives. He didn't win. And, you know, that that's sad. And I hope he, you know, he gets another good position, you know, moving forward. But that was like so bad for these guys that they they came out against me. And so my my response was, oh, well, I guess I'll argue my point. Let's go see what their actual opinion was. Until, and then I found out what their actual opinions are. Yeah, the greatest sin that you can commit these days in a lot of the most online individuals' minds is to be normal. You support you did the normal thing by supporting a normal conservative man trying to run for a nomination who had normal policies around supporting parental rights, reducing taxes, supporting gun owners and whatnot. But that was too normal. Either you're 
too normal for the liberals because they want crazy left-wing policies or you're too normal for these guys who want like race socialism despite the fact that they pretend to be libertarians well yeah, there's a big uh, a big gap in in uh, understanding on that like a big gap in logic there but yeah you, you nailed it one of the biggest so of course i, I got in a big uh, twitter battle over all of this and and the biggest accusation that was hurled at me is that i'm too much like tim pool and to me that's not a that's not an insult that's quite the compliment you know if, if i'm anything like tim pool a successful uh guy on youtube and in media holy cow thanks thanks for the the congratulations uh that would be in order for that but this is this is the case and and yeah a lot of people criticize tim pool for being too much of a fence setter but Everybody has a right to, you know, have their opinions and where they go. I think it's strange to go so crazy. What's that? I was going to say, that's always a weird accusation against Tim Pool. He actually has very strong opinions on certain issues where I'd maybe even disagree with him on. Yeah. But, like, he's not a fence He just happens to have very uh, heterodox takes on different issues. He's more Democrat on some things and more Republican on other things. So people say he's a fence because if you aggregate all of his views it's technically very centrist well i think what it is 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 when when people find themselves on the extremes of a thing and other people don't follow them along they they get I, for some reason they get upset that you're not you're not going to be extreme with them um i don't it almost feels like cult like behavior but i mean that's that's a thing now of course uh you know the left has their crazies and one of them is rachel gilmore and without without rachel gilmore there wouldn't be a diagonal i don't think i don't think there would be any sort of uh it just wouldn't have gone anywhere if it didn't get so much attention from this from this woman who used to work for was it global or was it ctv no it was global yeah like an actual publication like an actual publication that gave me a little bit of hope for global that they eventually fired her I actually believe it was after shortly after one of my articles they fired her. It's not because I did it. I would be glad if it was because of the article I wrote, but because she ended up trying to dox that uh, that friend of both of us, Bratney, on uh, Twitter. Right. That that's why she might have been fired by Hope So. But she was like helping Antifa dox an indigenous woman out in BC. Which is terrible. And <laughs> is that what she inevitably got fired about? Because uh, I know there was well, I, uh, there was another lawsuit involving uh, um, uh, James Top as well, where she had written an article and in the URL, it said white supremacist in the URL. And, and that's 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 libel at that point. There's I, I, yeah, I don't think it was my thing or it was that it was probably a combination of a lot of things. She could get a lot of attention for global, which maybe global needs because nobody wa reads their stuff or watches their stuff uh, in terms of the scale of the amount of money that they get from the government. They do not have a lot of viewership considering all the taxpayer money that is wasted on them. But uh, yeah, like I think that the attention ended up turning negative. So yeah, some publicity is bad publicity. <laughs> yeah, well, it was in this case. And it, it's funny because she was the, uh, the epitome of the meme of, you know, the news and media politicians all in one all in one breath i guess using these epithets of of you're a racist you're a misogynist you're a homophobe you're any of this stuff if you politically disagree with us but then as it turns out you know brought even a broken clock is what right twice a day um she had this video that came out and it was just it was it, like it was absurd this and then also the reaction to it Here's what's going on. As I've reported many times before, Diagalon is a far-right group that likes to pretend it's just a meme. While its prominent members expose its communities of thousands of people to stuff like this interview with an Australian neo-Nazi. What World War II represents is a man, Adolf Hitler, that went up against the Jews at every step of the way, and he almost freed all white people from the Jewish slavery up until the point where it became a world war. So the principle of what we can learn from World War II is let's do this again, but let's this time no more brothers wars. After and so she she goes on to say that we need to shut these people down, they shouldn't be able to speak, and all these other things. Where I disagree is like you know I, I think everyone should have a right to speak free speech is free speech and if you have bad ideas let them be seen let the, so let people know that these people have bad ideas and if those are the ideas half the time 
it benefit half the time it benefits these guys a lot to be censored because they can pretend it was the silly thing that they said that what got them censored and oftentimes it probably was the silly thing that got them censored you said something true about covid and so you got thrown off and then you can kind of sweep a bunch of other things that you said that were genuinely insane under the rug under the guys that actually was just this thing and if you're a pro and if you disagree with me on anything then you're pro censorship well, I can be against censorship. Also, I don't like it. I've even had people harass me online, attack me and whatnot. And I don't block, I don't even block them because I want to know what they're saying because I want to be able to respond if I feel the need to. Uh, by censoring people, you give them actually an air of mystique and there will be a pretty solid audience who will feel kind of beholden to them because this guy has gone through so much. So I need to watch him. I need to donate to him. I need to support him however I can. And I think that kind of, false sense of sort of you know being a, a follower or somehow being loyal to this person ends up making you more susceptible to agreeing with anything they say because if i disagree and now i'm part of the pro censorship mob oh I, i'm trying to cancel him so you've been calling this out for some time this is an old video yeah. um from actually and uh, wow it, like it goes back a while this is from almost two years ago, August 25th, 2022. Back when I had no viewership. <laughs> right, right. And there's hardly any views. The link is going to be in the description down below. Check out the whole video in its entirety. So I'll, I'll make sure that's the top link in the description down below. And make sure you're subscribed to the National Telegraph. But this was a video where you were actually calling out exactly this, that it's they only go after the silly stuff. They don't go after the actual egregious things that are said in these streams it seem like he's just a comedian that you're taking way too seriously like i'm i'll play a clip right now where he talks about the nuremberg trials being a kangaroo court and saying that herman goering was murdered because he was talking too much sense like i'll play the raw clip right here the nuremberg trial that well, was a kangaroo court they just hung everybody the funny part the funny part about that was they let herman goering speak once <laughs> and then he was he was like eh, shh he was saying too much tr he was talking too much sense and they just shut him down wouldn't let him talk and then he committed suicide right with the cyanide capsule they f murdered the guy they they even they even put it on uh, on radio i think in germany and people were like oh yeah. and you know they were like no he's got to go this guy's a problem and they just killed it they just killed everybody it was a kangaroo court it was ridiculous so got all this is the kind of opinions that that are being s uh, said on these shows and like like i said i'm not i'm not the type to want to censor i want to put sunlight on this i want people to see it for what it is cuz here here's my thing like there are really good people that are that are not awful don't say awful things like that um that are coming into the defense of of this group or non group uh, however you want to call it uh, that when the liberals do finally turn around and start showing these clips, this is going to tarnish good people's names. This is my my thing. Yeah. And even on somebody maybe less extreme than a Jeremy McKenzie, who is obviously saying something that anybody, if they see, hear it in their full context, they'd be like, yeah, of course I disagree with that. But like even I was calling this out with Arter Pulowski in Calgary, the, the, the pastor got famous because he was like yelling about how the, the Nazi Gestapo are trying to shut down my church. And people were rightfully sympathetic yeah. because they were shutting down a church during COVID and whatnot. And, and I was like telling people, guys, the man is kind of attention seeker over time. Don't trust him. Don't don't like cozy up to him. Don't do not do not donate to him because one, he already owns his building. He wasn't losing any money. And he actually owns three houses. People don't realize this. Uh, but, and the thing is like, don't cozy up to him because he will do anything for attention. And then in the provincial election, in Alberta, he basically tries to car start a controversy with Premier Danielle Smith mm -hmm. over you know, potentially, and it was never true, but him asking her to basically get the prosecutors off of him for his case about defying COVID lockdown uh, and uh, church shutdown rules, and it was like he was he was just purely doing that for attention. There was nothing there was nothing there that was actually politically useful that was going to help in his trial or help provincially. And he did that so he could start his own provincial party and then try and make him give himself a platform to speak from. And he's been doing this for literally over a decade of just finding issues to to use as a stump so that he can gain a lot of attention for himself and never follow through. I was well, telling people that that one really hurt church, him church during that election. I remember that because a lot of people were, felt betrayed by that because uh, they knew it wasn't true. And it, it was it was intended to hurt Danielle Smith. 
And the funny thing is the media who there in the entire time that they knew who Artur Pulaski was, was saying he is a, a horrible person, discredited, a conspiracy theorist and all this stuff. But then when he turns on Daniel Smith, there's 10,000 cameras in front of him when they're at the Edmonton legislature uh, filming him or some other sort of uh, uh, some official building. Everyone's there with microphones waiting for uh, the truth that he's going to reveal to show Daniel Smith's corruption. They all look like idiots when he's saying, oh, they offered me a million dollars and a free seat to run in. No, they didn't. <laughs> like, well, do you think they would let that guy within five blocks of a uh, of a local party uh, EDA office? No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't imagine. So especially after. Uh, well, especially after that. But then, you know, moving forward, we have uh, the, the media now is running with this story. They're all over this. Diag Dagalon founder denies connection with Conservative Party uh, Polyev. And this is from the Epoch Times. And this, this is covering, uh, well, this speech that Jeremy McKenzie did. He put it out on social media. Now, my, my kind of take on this was, wow, okay, so it, it sounds like he's he's putting some very um, particular, wor like, lawyer-y, wordy uh, words in there to, to make it sound like things are not a group. And, well, here, here's what he said in this one segment. Through thorough investigations of myself reveal they were unable to locate any noteworthy criminal or violent activity and could not even define Diagalon as a group in any traditional sense. At its core, it is a tightly knit in-group of like-minded folks that enjoy my podcast and commentary. So it's 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 not a group, it's just a, or, or in any uh, traditional sense. So it sounds very lawyery, something that he would use in his defense. Um, not, not so much, a, uh, Hey, uh, I'm not connected with Pierre Polyev, but it was a chance for him to get out there and get the attention. But he does say that he's not connected with Pierre Polyev. Uh, he says that here. Most of all that I cannot abide by and I cannot allow to transpire without challenge is a lie, which is what this prime minister and his team have been perpetuating. This is not the first or likely last time. The Conservative Party of Canada will have to suffer the indignity of dealing with this island of misfit toys called Diagalon, and it is very clear to my audience, as well as the CPC, I'm sure, and Mr. Polyev himself, that we are not mutual friends. In fact, there's a very deep, and I'm sure, mutual disdain for one another. So oh. that's, <laughs> that's that's a pretty cut and paste. You know, it's 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 very very clear there that they that they don't get along, and this is not something that they're they're hoping to move forward with i think it's it's a lot of attention seeking at this point and people who want to well, i don't think anyone any i don't think he answered a single question that anyone actually legitimately had because any liberal propagandist who's saying that somehow there's a connection between diagonal and the conservative party they're still going to say it because they knew it wasn't true in the first place and i think that the the video was more so just an attempt for him to come out and say something because maybe he's saying this because he has court cases and whatnot but why would you put on the Diagalon pin and be next to the Diagalon stickers all over your room if it's supposed to be just this is a neutral video to clear the air? It's very much he's there to represent himself as like the Diagalon leader. Yes, it's not a literal group, but there's a lot of things that are not literal groups that people still lead and are seen as like a figurehead within. That's basically a lot of, you know, our astroturf communist groups that are doing all these protests all over mm -hmm. both uh, the U.S. and Canada now on college campuses. None of these are groups, but they're very clearly organized. Well, it, it reminds me, yeah, the the Antifa thing. They, they say that they're not a group. That's the their whole M.O. I, we're not a group. We're not a real thing. Uh, but yeah, they they congregate online. They have symbolism. They have all this other stuff that they <laughs> they go with. But again, for those that are are you know maybe still waffling or on the fence on whether or not these guys uh, are in the camp of Pierre Polyev, uh, here's here's another clip. And these these are the other two hosts of the show. Uh, there's Ferryman Toll, and then there the two other uh, sidekick Derek here. It's not going to hurt us if PP denounces us. It's always well. This is going to help us. This is the thing I didn't mention too for the butt hurt conservatives that may be watching this. I don't care if we tank PP's career. By the way, if 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 we do, good. I hate him. He doesn't yeah. deserve it. He does not deserve to lead this country. Good. If it fucks with his career, I'm glad. I don't think it will, and I think it's ridiculous to think that it should, but. If it does, I don't. Why? Why would oh. I care? We hate him. 
retards are going to look at us and say, it's your fault he lost. Nope. No, it, I don't think anyone's going to say it's their fault. What what I... um, It was delusions of grandeur. Even if a uh, fairy man says their which is right, that they're probably not going to have an effect on pure Polyev and the trajectory of the conservative party at all. At the same time, he thinks he, he these people legitimately think that they're at the, the head of a movement. And if they merely talk to enough people and they start enough conflicts, then they will end up some, forming some sort of new right synthesis or whatever. Like they're basically Hegelian in nature, the way a lot of communists and socialists and fascist type people are. Not that they're literally those things. I would say that they're similar to many of them. But the idea that you know how do you know the idea of conflict, resolution, and synthesis, or the idea of by starting fights, starting these kind of obtuse uh, purity testing nonsense about whether or not you really stand up for the white race or not, that they're somehow going to force ideological clashes that will result in a synthesis that is then, you know, useful to them. Well, let's get into that because like this is where it all comes down to it. The, uh, you know, the, the idea is that the, you know, the government saying that these guys are uh, white identitarians and they they believe in you know eth ethnic state and all of that stuff you know white supremacy uh, by any you know dimension you want to you know your definition of it you want to say now the the people that are are coming in in at the aid of them are saying no that's not true it's a joke now but the 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 crazy part is is this is some of the stuff that they're actually talking about. And I, I'm going to preface this actually with a tweet from Elon Musk, because this is um, this is something that's been growing in popularity, this idea of the great replacement. Now, Elon Musk said uh, actually in response to uh, Eva Vlardingerboek's uh, speech about the great replacement. I thought you were just making up that name that I read the name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, it's probably right. All the same. No right. idea. You know, Dutch names are very difficult. Uh, but Elon Musk says the problem with the great replacement theory is that it fails to address the foundational issue of low birth rates. Record low birth rates leading to population collapse in Europe and even faster population collapse in most of Asia. Immigration is low in Asia, so there is no replacement going on. The, con the country simply are just shrinking away. If they're if this doesn't turn around, then the countries on of earth will low with low birth rates will become empty of people and fall into ruin, like the remains of what we see of the so so many long dead civilizations. And there's a lot of truth to this, this idea of uh, you know we need we need more people in these Western nations. And and the problem with low birth rates is the fact that well, yeah, we won't have people to replace us for all the jobs that are important in society. And if, if society doesn't fill these jobs, well, then society collapses. On top of that, we have politicians that don't want the doomsday to hit on their clock. And I'm not saying doomsday in any real sense of the matter. What I'm saying is a fiscal sort of doomsday where the social safety net kind of falls apart. And we have this pyramid scheme of uh, social security where people are promised a retirement at the age of 65. The conservatives tried to move it back because they were kind of look, trying to look at it reasonably. But then the liberals came back in and moved it back to 65. And nobody wants to be in power when that happens. So the easiest way to fix the problem in the short term is bring in a whole bunch of immigrants because then they'll be taxpayers. They'll be a tax base to pay for the retirees that are coming on to onto online as retirees and this becomes a problem for a lot of people because then it becomes a mass immigration issue and now a, a lot of us will have a problem with mass immigration and we don't i don't equate you know it's got to be one way or the other of these crazy extremes but there are groups that well, say it has to be extremes and again, and again, the sin that you're committing in many people's minds is that you're you're using a philosophy of reasonableness of what actually seems reasonable, what fits our current 
situation. Obviously, 500,000 new permanent residents per year is unreasonable. We can't cope with that. We aren't able to do any values testing it's at all. It's actually much higher, higher though. People speak English. Why? It's so... Yeah, yeah, that, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just talking about the permanent residents. Then there's also 1.1 million as of last year with permanent residents, temporary foreign workers, and students. And many of those people are not exactly leaving after their four years are up and no. they're immediately getting onto the permanent resident track. And yeah, no, it's it's fully unreasonable. But everyone, if you take a reasonable position, they freak out. Like I, I even just got back from door knocking today for my riding. It's Calgary Signal Hill. If you're a conservative, and you live in this riding. But <laughs> I talk to people who even define themselves as centrist. They say, oh, I don't like anything too left, too right. I'm I'm pretty much within the, the small, narrow band of the center left and center right. And when I mentioned that I want to reduce immigration because it's just too much and just math does not let us bring this many people in and reasonably house everyone and have good social services and a growing GDP per capita, mm -hmm. the, the, the person's eyes lit up. And they're like, yes, I don't know why anyone else is not talking about this. And this is probably someone who reflexively four years ago would have said, well, you're, why are you bringing up immigration? Isn't that a bit of a prickly issue? But it's so bad at this point. Reasonable people even with all the propaganda around the issue, are willing to say too much. Too much, we just can't do it anymore. We know that we cannot fit in seven families into every house. I mean, there's just the, the 500,000 people with only 200,000 houses being built a year doesn't work. And that's not even counting people leaving their parents' homes or, you know, the temporary foreign workers or students. And that's the best we can do is 250,000 or 225,000 homes a year that's yeah the, it's around that's there. the and average falling. that's across the entire nation by the way like that's that's all the whole country and and trudeau wants to build four million houses by 2031 which would basically require us to double house building or more than double house building in order to get there well good luck i mean there's just people to build them aren't there uh you know and you can you can bring people in but they they don't have the skills They're, they don't have the skills required to to do this stuff this isn't who other than Japan, Canada would be one of the more difficult countries to learn the construction and trade skills you need to build homes here because there's just so much more that goes into it. You know, it's not just putting up simple four walls, you know, and having the right plumbing and stuff. It's, you know, having the right insulation. It's having the right coating. It's making sure that things don't like, shatter when it gets too cold. It's needing all and it's like everything's much more intricate. Actually, in Canada, we're one of the best countries at building homes. We build houses the fastest at the greatest quantity per capita <laughs> in the entire G7. I'm cheating a little bit with that because obviously Japan doesn't need a lot of houses these days. And some of the other <laughs> they're G7 still countries. Building but them. overall, we're they're not still building them though. They, st they still are a little bit, but <laughs> like uh, in the sense that they don't exactly need to cope with uh, an expanding population because they're in fact shrinking. Yeah. But we're not bad at house building. But four million by 2031 like I, i'm not betting against us i'm just saying it's not possible no 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 and this this is indicative of trudeau's just nonsense he's just he wants to throw money yeah. at things and, and and just imagines that they happen no it takes yeah. it takes resources work workers it takes uh skills uh what i was going to mention when you were mentioning uh what goes into it a lot like every plumber and electrician and whatnot are going to be watching this going yeah this is true a ton of what you need to know is regulations and you have to keep up on those as well. So every year you got to read your reg books because you have to build to code or, you know, inspector can come in and shut down the whole operation. So this is, is it's very important that you're building the code. You can't just import people who don't know the, the regulatory code, even if they know the skills. It takes time to train these people on that stuff. But then it goes uh, it goes a step further to to be very extreme about it, to go from you know this this immigration system that we have is terrible to we should we should deport everybody and then canada should go back to being only white and this this is this is actually arguments that are that are brought forward by this group and and this is this is actually well, this is not reading between the lines it's like this is the flat statement we don't have to say now i'm going to explain to you what they mean no they'll just say it yeah, and actually, I got a clip here. This was actually incidentally. I had to record it because I thought it was like an off, uh, an off beat clip that I just managed to see. Uh, it turned out it was the first thing I watched uh, when I was just going to see what they were what they were on about, uh, so that I could uh, engage in, in in fruitful argumentation. I saw this and immediately went. I don't care what they have to say about me now. But then uh, it became a, a situation where I, I'm like, wow, people need to know because they're, they're coming to aid of these guys. And I'll, I'll show this clip here. Thing. This paleo conservatism or 
libertarianism. That's all fine. They act like the establishment acts like that's like their their mortal enemy. But really, that that's the show. You know, that's how you know it's controlled opposition because all of the people pushing it are allowed to continue pushing it. What they really despise is white identitarianism. And the reason they despise it is because they know that if white people see themselves as a collective and start acting in their own collective group interests, there's nothing in the fucking world that can stop them. That's the truth. If we as a people, as a group, decide collectively that we're going to come together and work towards our own interests as a people, no one in the fucking world can stop us from doing that. And they know this. And that's why Jared Taylor must be banned on Twitter. And that's why Patriotic Alternative isn't allowed to have an account. By the way, neither is Sam Melia or, or Laura Towler. So he's talking about other unsavory people that, that don't have accounts on, on social oh, no, media. Like, Nothing in the world can stop us when it seems like the stairs out of his basement are a massive roadblock for him doing anything in the real world. Oh, that's funny. Okay. <laughs> so here's, here's another clip where he's talking about assimilation and how, you know, foreigners, people not, that aren't white, uh, they can't do that. They just, they, they, their assimilation is not, it's a, it's a myth. He says they cannot assimilate. We've discovered this. There is no such thing as assimilation. Assimilation is an illusion. It's them basically putting on a costume. It's them putting on an act. They act like us. They wear our clothes. They speak our language. They watch our our gay sports ball. Yes, that that is assimilation. What happens? Well, as more and more of them come here, they assimilate less and less. And then this unique thing happens where the assimilated ones actually start desimilating. They go New back word. to their previous culture. And the more of them come, the more likely that is to happen. When there's one Sikh in 10 million Canadians, they kind of have to assimilate, assimilate. But that same Sikh or their descendants on a long enough timeline, if there becomes a large enough Sikh population, they will start going back the other way. So genetic uh, determinism. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to take that any true. other way. It's just, that's, that's so stupid. Some of the strongest christian countries in the world are places that were not christian a hundred years ago uh or more or whatever the mm -hmm. most baptist place on earth is a indian province in the northeast on the border of malaysia called nagaland it's 78 percent baptist it was the, these these people don't know what they're talking about who are they assimilating for in nagaland it turns out that people actually just believe the things that they believe and they do the things that they do for a reason I mean, it's not this idea where everyone's in this weird masquerade ball at all times, pretending to be other things other than what they really are at their base level. It's it, it's a completely stupid conspiracy to pretend that everyone's always up to something and that we can't have these people around because they'll do stuff. You know what I mean, as if as if like somehow every negative thing is somehow a, a, the the result of an outside group that's totally not us. <laughs> would i re resort to uh, becoming scottish if uh, if there was a if there were more scots around i don't know i just yeah, don't I get do. i do because i'm like a i'm like a i'm like a european mutt from all over the place i guess i just implode if there's not enough other white people around because i don't know what to do with myself <laughs> just yeah oh that's too funny but you know you challenge these ideas and then you get threats uh you get threats of violence and and that, that that's what i found out you know and you know for me, when 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 I when I see see a roadblock or I see um, I see a, you know pushback, I see it as a challenge, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm I'm going to engage with this. I'm going to see where this goes. And you know, my whole point with this whole exercise was to to show all the people who are coming to the aid. Like I'm talking good people coming to the aid and saying, no, 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 these guys aren't that, and I'm with them. Uh, to say, hey, maybe, maybe you ought not say that you're with, uh, with maybe people that you don't know. But anyway, this is the uh, the response that I got back because um, in, in my live stream and even talking with Marty, I mentioned that you know 
some of these guys, they're, they're just really hurt. And, you know, for good reason, so being a soldier, seeing bad things. And in that situation, you'd probably want to seek counseling. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, they most certainly insinuated that um, Jeremy is just a traumatized soldier who needs counseling. And that's what the oh. problem is here. Oh, really? Now I game. now I am going to beat the shit out of him in front of his wife? And when she's going to want to fuck me after doing it, I'm going to say, no, you're gross. Go away. Um, Disgusting. What a little bitch. He'd never fucking say anything like that to my face. Again, yeah. I'm I'm paraphrasing, so he probably... No, somebody else that. just told me this. Dude, you he fucking probably, better leave in a hurry. Leave this he, country fast. This is my country. Goodbye, he Clyde. He ties a channel. I was like, I don't yeah, care. Yeah, his country. And that, you know, so, like, I, that, it's just another thing to showcase. he can even leave his own town without his ankle monitor going off, oh. to be fair. <laughs> but, but don't worry, that's just me saying that. But, but that, that's just kind of a knee-jerk thing. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it goes to show that, like, this is all based on... Uh, emotions this is all just i, I mean it, it, the name of the the cast is is R raging dissident and and that's that, that's really the the driver in this it's not it's not logic it's not uh well thought out it's it's emotional it's it's based on it's it's being a weak man at the end of the day a man that needs to rage i need to be mad at things i'm gonna rant on stream for five hours it's like you're not a put together person and whether that's something i i i feel bad for you for because it's just a, a, like a block that you have you have some stress you have some deep grief in your life that makes you kind of like this way fair enough but at some point you're just being a weak man because i've never seen a historical documentary where they're talking about people like Teddy Roosevelt or people from like those early uh years of the 20th century who acted this way at all. I mean, who who were like angry and who needed to constantly get into these dramatic fights because you weren't trying to pick drama with them. No, no. The idea of that sounds so high school, except these guys engage in high school politics. And mind you, they engage in high school politics the same way Rachel Gilmore does, the same way Mark Garrison does, mm -hmm. the same way Justin Trudeau does. It's all about who said what to who, and I'm upset about it. And he 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 somehow you know like uh, like belittled me or whatever, or just like uh, slighted me. And it's all about slights. Where like four grown men are on stream talking about slights as if anyone should care. Well, and, and uh, well, three three grown men without children talking about the Great Replacement. I mean, get get having kids if if that's the concern, because uh, that's the whole point. Of, even Elon Musk was saying, everybody get out there and make make babies. Uh, you know, society could collapse because of it. And yeah. you know, the They're very traditional men. That's why they have made being white their religion, and they don't go to church on Sunday. I would guess. Well, so I just I really see it as as scapegoating. It, like any other form of mm -hmm. prejudice, is really a, a scapegoat. Uh, scenario. Maybe it's ironic that their that their uh, mascot's a goat because they're they're looking for a scapegoat, and you know they found it with Jewish conspiracy theories, the uh, the the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is a debunked uh, old. Uh, apparently, it came from some Latvian novel or something like that, predating the first publication of it. Uh, act, like perfectly lifted from it, and. You know, it's embarrassing. It's been embarrassing to a lot of people. It was, it was embarrassing to Henry Ford when he had to apologize on his own publication for having spread that uh, conspiracy theory for so many years and then being proven false, like without a doubt, <laughs> proven false about it. But back when back when people actually owned up to their mistakes a little bit. Yeah. Like I'm not, Henry Ford is definitely not a perfect man. Well, wasn't that better in an era when someone was wrong about something? They would actually come out in their own publication, spend their own money saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, he, incidentally, he made his own publication because he was mad that the other uh, publications wouldn't talk about it <laughs> for years. And, and that's what he did. But but here's the thing. So, again, another scapegoat. Uh, you know, a few months back, I did a, a show with uh, Darshan Maharaja, and he's a, a brilliant independent journalist who's been covering this uh, the, the student scheme, the, the uh, student visa scheme. And yeah, all the fake colleges. That's right. All the fake colleges that are just bringing people in. And it, it's it's an immigration backdoor. Now, what 
was unbeknownst to me until I dive, dove into this story was how many people on the Indian side that are coming in are getting scammed. And a lot of those people are in dire straits as well. They wouldn't have come to Canada if they thought they were going to get schemed and scammed and put into a situation like this. They're just looking for a better life for themselves as well. You, yeah, you get those crazy situations where or somebody, an immigration lawyer promises you a job working at some other business he owns and, oh, it's actually going to be like $30 an hour but you have to pay him $20 of your wage to cover all your legal costs or he's, you know, maybe not going to file your paperwork right and you're going to get deported and he's going to be with the one in forms on you. And so it's effectively a form of like soft modern day slavery mm -hmm. where you have people coming in from foreign countries and they're living in half a basement suite, maybe not even that. I've seen the, the stories of people just lined up on cots and each one of those cots is costing them 500 bucks a month yeah. and they're having to work at the immigration lawyer's business and they're effectively just stuck there because they can't they don't have enough money to go home and it, the only way to basically going home is getting themselves deported but who would want to do that and uh and effectively have to violate the law and have to live on the streets until the country basically gives you a free plane ticket to go home well not, not to mention the their parents sold the farm in order to to get them over and they're on the hopes that oh. they're going to get an education and become you know wealthy and be able to bring their it's like family. joining an MLM. Everyone who joins an MLM wants to pretend and at some point that you start gaslighting yourself into thinking that eventually this will end and I'll have a better life at the end. And I actually got literally two days ago. Multi-level marketing uh, for people who don't know the uh, abbreviation. So yeah, if you yeah. didn't understand that the abbreviation there. Yeah, it's stuff like um, whatever. What's a, what's a good Either one? Either get rich quick things by buy these products and then you sell them off and you get other people to peddle the Tupperware or whatever it is. Find, yeah. Yeah. I was trying to find the name of spe a specific one I remembered or whatever. It doesn't really matter. They're shaped like but a pyramid like Monday, for a reason. <laughs> yeah. It was, I was, it was, it's all about basically getting other people to sign up to also sell. And it's, it's, it's a ridiculous thing yeah. when the product is not actually where all the money's coming from. Uh, anyway, so, but on Monday I was talking to some people, uh, and they said the people right next to their house, it's some per, uh, PR who owns the house, he's from China and he's bought this house and he's literally selling and renting individual rooms. And even though the state knows about it and it's illegal and he doesn't have the permit to have all these secondary suites and all these illegal renters in this area, there's people on meth who are living in this house who are like meth addicts smashing up people's cars. And this is a very sleepy suburban neighborhood. They wouldn't do anything about it. And this one man who owns this house and doesn't even live, he's not even a citizen of the country, is making thousands and thousands of dollars a month off of desperate people who have nowhere else to live. So yes, the rent's technically cheaper than elsewhere, but he's only giving you one singular room and he's renting to 12 people at the same time out of a single detached family house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the housing situation is just it's not getting any better in canada that's that's absolutely for sure and i really took it down a rabbit hole oh here, but yeah, man the oh. well it, it hits me close to to heart because i'm being evicted from my place uh a house that we lived in for 10 years and we're, we're not sure what the reason actually is uh, but um it, this is the market this is the market that we live in and we, we probably won't even be able to live in this town anymore we're making we're making plans to possibly move to texas in the near future so that, that that's that's where we are so that that's hitting me close to home but yeah getting back to this it, it seems like full circle justin trudeau needs these guys as much as they need justin trudeau and i i've even i've even put it out there that they're actively campaigning for him. They hate they hate Pierre Polyev. Uh, it seems like uh, that this is how they're gonna they're gonna maintain their their showing online. Well, how well, who's gonna watch their show if everything's actually getting better? I mean, wages are going up, immigration starts cooling down. Who's gonna be raging about immigration when it's only one hundred fifty thousand new permit residents a year, and we've restricted how many temporary foreign workers can come in and students? It's like well. There's nothing really to rage against when it's there's no real problems going on. And there's a lot of people out there who like to exploit crises. It happens all the time in the U.S., especially because there's a lot of money in politics in the U.S. Mm. People who create fake controversies, fake crises in order to get a lot of attention on the news. Because even if you're not making any money, there is a certain personality out there who just likes being on camera. 
look at Jagmeet Singh. I don't think that man actually wants his pension. He would sacrifice his pension if he could be in politics as the NDP leader for another 10 years. He just likes being on camera and knowing that if you were to make a documentary about this political moment, you have to talk about him. That's why he wears a Rolex watch, even though it's such a bad move as a socialist politician. He likes being seen as glamorous, and that's what he's all about. But you still get the same people who, on the other side of the spectrum, <laughs> like Jeremy McKenzie, like these ferryman guys, Derek Rance, who like the attention of being the most edgy, who like being on the fringe of politics. If, if there was a lot more people who joined them on their side of the spectrum, they would then move further into whatever they believe. I mean, they would they would start purity testing harder. So that they're always the one who's like the big gorilla in the room, the you know, the big monkey at the top of the hierarchy of crazy people. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes me wonder, like when when people get down these rabbit holes and they start fomenting and and uh, going to the extremes. Do they really believe this stuff? <laughs> Do you know, what I mean, because like in my in my head, I, I can't. I just can't grasp it. Like the whole idea. I mean, I get, maybe it's the libertarian in me. I, I, I think that everybody should have equal rights under the law. And I could never, I could never even imagine advocating for a piece of legislation that would go and let, round people up based on the color of their skin and and take their their rights away, like their citizenship and and oh, deport sorry. them, things like that. Like it's just. It's just it, it, it's crazy to me, just the, the concept. This is, this, this is always, and again, I know somebody's going to say, oh, why? Like, oh, of course, that's such a woke position for you to take. But I'm like, I, this is not the way I mean it at all. And I know some people will, will, will take it and overexpand it. But this is the problem with having people who are supposedly engaging in politics who are joking all the time. Maybe they started off only joking and it's just fun jokes. I'm being a little bit edgy. Maybe I'm a little bit more. Uh, you know, restrictionist on immigration than the vast majority of people. Maybe this is how they start out. But you can't joke around one 24-7 without kind of believing the things that you're joking about. Well, what are you going to do? Just you're a complete jet court jester. Your entire career is just saying things that you don't actually believe. Eventually, the person believes the things that they're saying because you could never wait. There's not that many Sam Hyde's in the world who truly everything to them is performance art and they don't believe anything that they're saying. And I think with a lot of these guys, maybe they start out as edgy kind of pranksters online, but eventually you do believe the things that you're saying. And I think that you can't go, it's like whenever you meet a liar, someone who lies all the time, they believe their lies, even though they know they're lying. And it's like in, this is a very strange example because I just finished this documentary series from the Daily Wire on the Red Empire. Uh, and they're talking about how, well, why did the communist courts even bother convicting people and forcing out confessions before they executed them when they knew it was all cooked up? It's like, well, because you got to believe the lie a little bit. So just getting to the confession makes it feel a little bit more real to you. Oh, that's just it's it's dirty. It's dirty at that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is kind of performative. And and some of these guys have been at it for a very long time and and uh kind of alluding to an incident that that happened a bunch of years ago actually i've got this uh one up here so this is derek uh of the of the group uh toronto sun columnist wax a far right youtuber with a walking cane at a chaotic maxime bernier event so this is at a maxime bernier event incidentally about immigration um this is at a time when it was i don't believe it was mass unfettered immigration at the time it was just you know there was immigration and uh, this and for context here, Tariq Fatah, who is the man with the cane, would be like one of the first people who to oppose mass immigration without like values testing, because that's very much the type of man Tariq Fatah is. So much of his career was going after Islamists and Islamist front groups for trying to exploit uh, the loose laws all around Canada in order to perpetuate the things that they believed in. Right. And here's the confrontation here. Come on, me. I can push you the f so lots of swearing there's a, a shove and then a, a whack with the cane and the reason why i say it's kind of performative you you see like it was it was a stumble back but it didn't seem like much but later it came with uh <laughs> with one of these videos so i just wanted to give you guys a quick update as to what is going on so <laughs> obviously clarify and let's clarify this is not a this is not a cut uh, clip from a trailer park boy. No, no, <laughs> no. It came with, I was surprised he didn't have the neck brace and all, all that stuff. But uh, you know, it, it's a performative thing at the at at any right. 
And even just the fact that he has a cigarette in his mouth before he starts recording it, like he doesn't need that. He just wants to feel like a tough guy who goes into these like, to like these like these like heated confrontations and uh that if he gets beaten up it was really bad no I mean, it wasn't just gonna got swacked by an older man in the head with a cane it, it, it's somewhere where no he doesn't need a ban- it was on the side of his head it was he didn't like jab him in the eye no but he feel, looks like he just got of eye surgery right here he's got lasik <laughs> maybe he did maybe he did maybe he got uh got that better vision i maybe i should go out and get that i think the, the glasses have grown on me so i i'm gonna i'm gonna stick with them they're <laughs> you, you can't be a conservative and also and, and also stop wearing glasses now or you or you or you'll be accused of trying to copy pure poly oh that's so mm, you're, yeah. you and I are forever stuck wearing glasses forever it's it's a it's a branding thing <laughs> at any rate too as well uh but yeah no the the theme i guess at the end of the day is um be, be careful what you what's the old expression uh you know don't stand too close to manure or else you'll end up smelling like it. Uh, yeah. People are coming to the aid of people online uh, and they're doing it because they have one thought of it. And again, it's kind of like a boy that cried wolf. If everybody's being labeled uh, pretty bad things, then you just think that everybody who's being labeled that it's it's just it's it's not actually real. Uh, but some of that well, stuff there's exists. A lot of, there's a lot of people out there who use rhetoric and I get what they're talking about. And a lot of it's not completely, it's not wrong to say, but when they say that more people need to be uh, woken up to the truth or they, more people need to wake up about the truth about media corruption and the lies of the liberal party and government and legacy media and all that, that's fine. But what you don't want to do is because these people correctly identify the liberals and the legacy media and the NDP, they think based on algorithm. You're a conservative and you don't agree with us. You must be a racist. And it just becomes the, you know, if, if X, then Y kind of thinking, well, you don't agree with us. Ergo, you're a racist. You're intolerant. You're a bigot, whatever. But what you don't want to do is engage in algorithmic thinking from the other side. Well, they called the guy racist. So that must mean he's not racist at all. Or maybe a broken clock can be right twice a day Mm -hmm. or that this is the game of places like anti-hate Canada and press progress and some of these other far left websites. They will take actual racist people and they will connect them to reasonable individuals with the flimsiest of grounds. But there is a kernel of truth at the end of the day to what they're saying is that this person's bad. So like Paul Fromm, the guy who's an actual like longtime white supremacist since like the 80s. Every time he goes to a conservative event, and because Paul Fromm is an attention seeker, he will go and meet and donate to mainstream conservative politicians. And he just so happens to always get photo- photographed by Press Progress or somebody else who then anti-hate or Press Progress used to report on. Mm. And that they can then say, well, why are you shaking hands with Paul Fromm, even though nobody knows who this man even looks like or doesn't know who he, what he, who he even is? Because he's an incredibly obscure figure. But then you'll get people now saying, well, they said that, you know, X individual who's obviously not racist is racist. Well, that must mean that Paul Fromm must be not be racist and that Jeremy McKenzie must not be racist and that they're actually very reasonable individuals. Some of the times they actually are right. And they use the fact that they are sometimes right as evidence that they are always right because they the left are algorithmic thinkers, but do not become an algorithmic thinker to then combat them. It's what James Lindsay says, uh, rightfully so, and it's more so that he's just quoting Marxist academics themselves, that your reaction is their action. Whatever they're doing, their main goal is to get you to react in a foolish manner. So by calling everybody racist, they can get you to start defending actual racist people as not racist because, well, 90% of the time they're completely wrong. But that's how you're going to get backed up into a corner and you're going to start losing these political battles Mm -hmm. and not know why. And you're going to be like, but they're always lying. And now I'm being attacked because I was defending that man. Well, you got to check in who it was. That's where I I advocate for a philosophy of normalcy and reasonableness. You got to actually do your own research because there's a lot of people who always stress doing their own research, but then they will engage in the same left wing algorithmic thinking well this person said this so i believe this well and that's that's exactly what i did because i was like i was blown away at what i was seeing at first because i was like this can't be true they don't actually believe this do they and then i i viewed more i was i was you know enamored with it because i'm like this can't be true um and then 
uh, when I called it out, my purpose on uh, so last weekend, it was you know a couple of tweets that I put out, and I got bombarded. And the the purpose of it was to get them to say exactly what it is that they think. I, I was it was a calling them out to say, here's an open forum so that everybody can see what you what you genuinely believe, not. And then it's not me saying that you say this; it's you saying it with your own words. And then, uh, and holy cow, did they deliver? Is absolutely, this is where sunlight absolutely is the best disinfectant. Because when you tweeted out those clips, what they did, which was hilarious, is half of them were acting like weasels and saying, "No, you're lying. You're twisting the words." Or it might have been legitimately confused people who don't really know much of the backstory and they think it's maybe hyper edited clips. Yeah. So there's yeah. half the people are saying, "No, you're twisting what we're saying. That's not actually what we believe." And then the other half is saying, "What's his physiognomy? Is he Jewish? Blah blah. He's married to someone who isn't white." And it's like, yeah, yeah, this is what some of these people are actually like. Because although racists are rare. They still exist. Oh man, I got called a race traitor. I got called so many different things. I got called. I got called Tim Fool. <laughs> you know, back to that. But that one's not too bad. Yeah, that one's not that too you bad. Have a successful podcast, and look at you. It's true. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, a lot of a lot of language that's against uh, gay people. I have no problem with gay people. I, I do have an issue with teaching kids stuff in school about sexuality. I do, I, I do across the board, mind you. I don't think kids are sexual beings, and they shouldn't be taught about sexuality. Yeah, the birds and the bees, the how how the, bo- the human body works, that's fine. But again, uh, consenting adults, I have no issue with. Uh, I don't, I don't have any issues with a lot of these things. I don't know why people would assume that I would, I would get on board with any of this uh, extreme sort of rhetoric. Hmm. Hmm. But this is why politics in Canada is crazy these days. The more crazy the left goes, the more crazy you get kind of these grifters and attention seekers online. And the funny thing is a lot of these people like ballyhoo the fact that they're actually super popular. And did you know that I'm like, you know, I have all these followers online or whatever. It's like, it's not that hard (laughs) to, to frankly take a dump in public and get someone filming it and then putting some attention on it. Well, I mean, my following is just because I'm passionate about the thing and I, I talk about it every single day. So, you know, consistency you can, is, is you can the actually structure the things that you say. You don't just have seven hour streams where you're talking to three other guys about nothing. No, I like to have a clear thought. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. I like to have a clear, concise thing that I want to talk about and, and say that. And this this is why I had you on uh, today to talk about specifically this and how crazy things have gotten when it comes to rhetoric and whatnot. So how can people find you and what your your campaign and your presence online? Yeah, so if you guys want to find me, the easiest way of doing it is just going onto YouTube, just typing in the National Telegraph. It's super easy to find us. We'll be the first one that pops up. You can go look me up, Wyatt Claypool, on X. I guarantee I'm the only Wyatt Claypool account unless there's a doppelganger I don't know about right now. And uh, if you live on the west side of Calgary, you might be in my riding of Calgary Signal Hill. The riding boundaries just changed. So if you're like looking at the downtown core, if you're straight west from the downtown core, there's a very good chance that you're in my area. And if you are buy a conservative party membership, vote for me number one on your ballot and you know all the other stuff I usually say in my own videos, but I'm now hijacking Clyde's channel. To say it. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Thank you for joining me today. And, uh, and uh, well, well, we'll have you on again to talk about this. Oh, so absolutely. Thanks for having me on.